So uh, welcome everyone to our uh, sixth um, edition for the SOAS World Philosophies Lecture. Um, and uh, this will be the last for the year 2021. And um, we are pleased to have a uh, guest speaker, Professor Veli Mitova with us. Um, as you know, the, the SOAS World Philosophies Lecture is organized by the SOAS World Philosophies Program. And um, one of my colleagues is here with us, uh, Dr. Andrew Hines. Thank you for joining us. And um, it's organized in line with our approach to uh, doing philosophy here at SOAS um, in a way that is inclusive and uh, decolonized, uh, where we see philosophy not simply from the Western lens, but from a global lens, looking at different philosophical traditions. And today's uh, theme definitely speak um, to that approach to doing philosophy uh, because it has to do with questions about epistemic decolonization as well as epistemic injustice. And so we are really looking forward to hearing um, uh, from uh, Professor Veli Mitova uh, about her topic. Um, Professor Veli Mitova is a um, professor of philosophy at the University of Johannesburg. She is also the director of the African Center for Epistemology and Philosophy of Science. Um, she is also the South African team leader for the Geography of Philosophy project and the principal investigator for the Epistemic Injustice Reasons and Agency project, which is funded by a Newton Advanced Fellowship. Um, uh, Professor Mitova has published very widely uh, in this area, in the area of epistemic. Uh, if you could mute yourself, please. Yeah. Uh, in this area of epistemic decolonization and epistemic injustice, and some of our works include um, uh, the book, Believable Evidence, and Effective Tone in Epistemology. She also edited the um, special issue for philosophy. Uh, it's a philosophy papers, yeah, in 2020, uh, titled Epistemic Decolonization. Uh, today, she'll be speaking on the uh, theme, um, is epistemic injustice, white people stuff. So we really look forward to your talk and you have our full attention. Thank you so much, Elvis. And, and thank you for giving me the last word of the year. It's, it's such a privilege. Though obviously one could have chosen the year better, but uh, it, it's a great privilege um, having the last word. Um, and I also wanted to thank you for running the series because I think that in the last two years, it, it's been people like you who have been keeping us sane and connected um, uh, through series like this, um, where we can exchange ideas. So I really appreciate that. Um, so you should be able to see my screen if you can just give me the, the thumbs up. Awesome, thank you. Um, so the, the inspiration uh, for this talk was a, a, another talk that uh, Lewis Gordon gave at the University of Johannesburg last year. Um, and there he was trying to build up a kind of toolbox for, for a critical race theory. And um, when the discussion time came, uh, one of the audience, I, I won't say who, to protect the guilt, um, asked him why he's not using any epistemic injustice tools. So it seemed like some epistemic injustice tools uh, could be quite useful for what he was doing, things like epistemic exploitation and so on. Um, and his answer was uh, lengthy. Uh, you can, you can uh, find it in my bibliography. Uh, but uh, it started with the statement that epistemic injustice is stuff that white people do. I won't tell you how it goes on, not to spoil it. Um, and, and this kind of got me thinking because you, you do hear this uh, stuff. You know, very often you hear people say epistemic injustice uh, uh, talk is kind of white people stuff, or some, some people say white women's stuff. Um, I, I prefer keeping it more neutral uh, gender wise, but, uh, but one certainly hears these, uh, these statements in, uh, in general in academia. Um, and I was, I was a bit puzzled by, 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 by this comment of, of Gordon's as well as others. Uh, because it looks, it looks like the epistemic injustice literature um, 
sorry, the epistemic decolonization literature abounds in epistemic injustice talk. Uh, so you get it uh, in, so people are talking about epistemicide, that's Gross Fogel, for example, um, and, and certainly uh, uh, Boaventura de Sousa Santos, both in, in several of his books and at the last SOAS lecture, um, uh, at the fifth SOAS lecture a few weeks ago. Um, other people closer to my home in Africa uh, uh, talk about cognitive justice, uh, one, of the, one of the theorizers of epistemic decolonization, uh, Sabel and Lovo de is, is such a person, um, and others as well talk about uh, directly about epistemic injustice. So someone like Jonathan, Chim Jonathan Chimokonen um, and um, uh, Edwin Etiebo. So let me just start my timer so I don't um, abuse your patience. Um, so, uh, so the literature on epistemic decolonization abounds in epistemic injustice talk. Uh, moreover, many decolonial notions are easily translata translatable in epistemic injustice terms. Uh, so for example, Walter Mignola's uh, zero point, which is a kind of universalist conceptions, uh, conception of knowledge with a with a, with a disembodied subject at its center, um, uh, very easily uh, translates into, into the kind of um, uh, Cartesian picture of, of uh, the knower that has been reviled for a long time uh, by uh, both feminist epistemologists and uh, epistemic injustice theorists, um, so, such as, for example, Patricia Hill Collins and, and Sierra Harding. So, so then the, the puzzle is, well, how could this be white people stuff uh, if it's useful for dismantling white people epistemic hegemony, right? Um, and, and I really couldn't understand uh, the problem and why people were saying this. Um, and obviously I take it uh, for granted that this is a pejorative thing to say, right? Um, until, until I saw this talk by, by Gail Polhouse uh, at Vienna, the way we, we go around the world nowadays. Um, and, and I won't immediately give away the game. I'll, I'll hold off a little bit uh, for, the, for the realization. So, so what I want to do um, in this talk is to show you that at least, or at least people who say that this is white people stuff, um, to show you that at least some epistemic injustice tools can be theoretically useful. And here my paradigm example uh, is going to be uh, of epistemic decolonization. So the thinking is, uh, White people stuff means that it's, it further oppresses those whom it's meant to liberate. Um, and epistemic decolonization, of course, is the paradigm of just the opposite. Uh, so I'm going to try and show you that epistemic injustice tools can be useful for epistemic decolonization uh, and moreover being useful without falling prey to the uh, white people stuff challenge. And so those of you who like bumper stickers, uh, here's what I would have on my, on my car. Uh, if I was into bumper stickers, uh, epistemic injustice tools, uh, I will argue, are both um, sharp and safe. Now, why should, why should anyone care? Uh, why should uh, this World Series care? Uh, well, I, I, think, um, I think that if the white people stuff challenge is correct, um, then a whole body of literature becomes extremely dubious. Um, uh, the whole of epistemic injustice literature uh, becomes dubious. And I think that, you know, that, that's not just going to <laughs> result in uh, job losses, uh, given what, a, what a, uh, an industry epistemic injustice has become, uh, but I think that we'll really lose some um, fundamental insights uh, and a kind of influence over both the academic and public world uh, that theorizes, feminist theorizers, uh, have gained recently um, in, you know, for, for, for the good of humanity in general. So, so that's why I think that one should care about um, whether, whether epistemic the epistemic injustice debate uh, can meet the challenge. So the way I'm going to uh, uh, proceed from here is uh, first I'm going to sharpen the challenge a bit to see what it amounts to. Uh, then I'm going to give you a very kind of basic uh, baby version of, of what I take epistemic decolonization to be. Uh, and then I'll, I'll think of three notions from the epistemic injustice literature and show you that they're very useful for theorizing epistemic decolonization without falling prey uh, to the white people stuff challenge. So let me uh, start with, uh, with 
a couple of disclaimers. Uh, this is world philosophies, but uh, you know, I come from a kind of analytic background where one feels the need for this uh, kind of stuff. So, uh, so the, the first the first disclaimer is that um, I'm not interested in a couple of things in doing a couple of things. So, first of all, uh, I'm not interested in addressing potential concerns or sensitivities that some white people might have uh, about the crude way I'm framing the challenge. I'm, I'm doing it in terms of white people. Uh, it's deliberately, it deliberately crude because people make the statement, um, but, but if some people are offended, I, I think I'm not going to address that kind of offense. I think we've heard enough of white people's perspective and we're now uh, addressing other perspectives. I'm also not interested in this question because, uh, you know, to, to kind of uh, exonerate myself because I work in this area, right? Uh, or to justify my work in this area. Um, and I'm also not really interested uh, in it uh, for, for exegetical reasons. So I'm not particularly concerned about where they get right uh, Gordon's uh, objection uh, precisely or whether I get it right at all. Uh, rather, uh, what I want to do is how the challenge can be formulated in its most philosophically fruitful way and also in a way that's the most potentially threatening uh, in the fight against epistemic oppression. So, so, that's, so that's the aim here. Um, and with that in mind, I think you could give two readings uh, to the challenge. So the first reading is a kind of statistical uh, reading. Well, most people who work on, on epistemic injustice are white. Um, and this might or might not be true, I'm not sure actually, uh, but, but either way, on its own, it's not going to be a very philosophical interest, I presume. Uh, of course, it could be if it means that a certain privileged perspective dominates and marginalizes others. Obviously, that would be a problem. But then we're going to be uh, into some form of a normative reading. So um, what would that amount to? And I think that the, the at least four ways of spelling out a normative reading. reading. Um, and I'll start with a well, relatively most innocuous one and kind of work my way uh, to, to the worst possible one as far as I'm concerned. Um, so the, the first one, uh, the first reading would be something like um, what Christy Dodson calls the rhetoric of beginnings. So in this context, it would be something like, uh, well, look, black feminists have forever uh, discussed these uh, these, the ideas that the epistemic injustice literature discusses. Um, and then came along a few white feminist epistemologists. They rebranded the, the terms, claimed them as their own, and off we go, aren't we clever, right? Um, I mean, obviously this is a caricature, but, but you know what I mean. Um, and, and obviously if, if this is the case, then um, it's a serious problem, uh, if, especially if these notions are claimed to be new, uh, or exclusive property uh, to white feminists uh, and or used to perpetuate uh, white privilege. Um, and in case this needs uh, spelling out, uh, this kind of thing would be a, 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 an epistemic injustice, if I'm allowed to even use this term in this context, um, in itself, because it would involve, um, in uh, Gail Polhouse's terms, uh, disrespecting whole groups of knowers and encouraging habits of intention that disregard certain knowers as knowers. And this, uh, if, if anything, is the sort of definition uh, of epistemic injustice. So that's one way of hearing the challenge. Second way uh, is what Patricia Hill Collins calls institutional incorporation um, and the kind of resultant, uh, as she puts it, deterioration of emancipatory possibilities. Uh, so so the, here the idea would be that you're institutionalizing epistemic resources, the epistemic resources of the, of the marginalized, and then you start using them as an institution for the benefit of the dominant know, because institutions are dominated by the dominant know. Um, and Hill Collins uh, gives the example of uh, the notion of inter intersectionality. So um, she, she argues, I think correctly, that it's been completely decontextualized in academia um, and there, therefore it's been stripped of its emancipatory uh, 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 powers, uh, which it had from, from the political activist context uh, in which it arose initially. Um, and there's a clear connection between the, these two ways of hearing the challenge, right? Uh, so, um, so for example, it, it's been uh, to a large extent, Kimberly Crenshaw has been credited with the origin of the notion 
um, as, uh, as uh, Patricia Hill Collins notes. notes. Uh, and so there's a, there's a sense in which instead of crediting uh, political activism with the notion, uh, we now also uh, assume that, that the origin of the notion comes from us acad academics, right? Um, and in this, to, to reiterate, has the result, uh, and this is uh, Gail Pohau speaking, uh, that uh, you basically, uh, you're taking uh, resistant resources, uh, which are initially shaped to serve the interests of, of the oppressed, uh, uh, in, you're now taking them over for those uh, who, who, who already have all the privilege. Uh, and in her words, she says, they, they're shaped to serve the interests of those with social power, and they can become distorted and made to serve dominant interests in these distortions. So that's the second uh, way of hearing the challenge. Third way, uh, again, Christy Dotson uh, in a different paper uh, where she, she thinks of, um, uh, of ways in which the epistemic injustice literature uh, uh, has perpetuated, sorry, perpetuated certain wrongs uh, in the process of attempting to address them uh, because of, of, of uh, its use of close, what she calls closed conceptual structures. Uh, and she thinks she's thinking here of, of Fricker's initial distinction between uh, epistemic bad luck and, um, 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 and epistemic injustice. And she argues that that contrast in itself uh, forecloses the possibility uh, of, uh, of what, what she uh, terms contributory injustice. And I'll, I'll have a lot more to say about contributory injustice uh, later. So the, the fourth way uh, and final way that, we, that I'm going to discuss uh, that we can hear the challenge is that somehow the very perspective of epistemic injustice, the, the perspective that people in the debate uh, adopt is intrinsically, intrinsically marginalizing. Um, and this was certainly uh, something that uh, Lewis Gordon discussed in his objection to epistemic injustice uh, that, that I said inspired this talk, uh, partly because justice is already a kind of liberal concept. And so, it comes with a framework that's precisely responsible to a great extent for capitalism, colonialism, all the things that have caused epistemic injustice in the first place. Um, so, so it seems weird to, to, be expecting, uh, for, uh, to be expecting this kind of framework to address the problem that it's caused to a large extent. Um, and, and also, and this, this was my revelation um, in, that I promised to share with you from Gail Paul, Paulhauser's talk uh, earlier this year, that somehow epistemic injustice, the whole debate, leaves us stuck in, our, in, in ways of fixing the problem uh, from the dominant perspective. So, I mean, even if you think about like the original stuff that, that Fricker discusses, it's how do I become more just? How do I become more virtuous? And I, of course, am the dominant person right, who's asking these questions. And then the, the worry is that if you do that, then you're re-marginalizing the very people that, that you're trying to, to unmarginalize, right? Through, through this whole uh, uh, work, body of work in epistemic injustice. So I think that this is the most damning way of, of hearing uh, uh, the white people's stuff challenge. Um, and I think this because uh, the other ways, all the other normative ways are kind of contingent and fixable problems. I mean, I'm not saying that they're easily fixable, but they're not, there's nothing intrinsically about the epistemic injustice discourse that causes these problems. And so the way to fix, for example, the rhetoric of beginnings problem would be to say, guys, like, can we, sorry, guys is probably inappropriate in this context, but um, whatever. Um, can we please stop for a second uh, and credit the original uh, authors of these concepts? Um, and then likewise with institutional incorporation, can we please think about the, the way these concepts and these, these tools have been uh, designed by marginalized communities. So instead of adopting them for our own purposes um, as, uh, as dominant knowers and institutions, can we please revive them, return them to the, to the original uh, emancipatory and empowering state? So, I mean, obviously this is easier said than done, but at least it's in principle uh, doable, right? Whereas um, if the fourth reading is correct, 
uh, if the very perspective of systemic injustice is intrinsically marginalizing, then we should really just scrap uh, uh, epistemic injustice talk altogether. Um, and one way, one way of making this uh, vivid is, is with uh, Audrey Lord's pithy remark that, that you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools, right? So uh, to, to put, put in a bumper sticker version, uh, this version of the challenge would be that epistemic injustice tools are the master's tools. You should just abandon them. These are the wrong tools for the fight. So this is the, this is the challenge that, that I want to uh, uh, focus on. And I think that, that it can be met. Uh, and remember, I'm going to show you this uh, by showing you that some of, at least some of the epistemic injustice tools can help us with uh, epistemic decolonization. And therefore they can't be uh, intrinsically marginalizing. On the contrary, as it will turn out. So I will be really uh, stick to basics with, with epistemic decolonization. This is a, obviously a, a new debate on its own and it's a very rich debate and it's increasingly um, growing. So, um, so I can't possibly do it justice. So I'll just stick to a couple of points, um, features of epistemic decolonization that will enable, enable me to say um, what I want to say about uh, how epistemic injustice tools can help with epistemic decolonization. So I take, um, and I've you know, argued about the, uh, for this, and but others have as well, uh, the project of epistemic decolonization to be essentially a project of epistemic recentering. And that means, uh, to use again, uh, Sabelle Blobogoceni's uh, uh, notion, it's reclaiming and also being able to use the right uh, to think and theorize from your own geographic and sociocultural location. And that in turn, in turn means that you get to choose for yourself your, the focus of your epistemic endeavors in accordance, in accordance with this geographical, political, socio, whatever location. Right, which comes with distinctive epistemic schemas, uh, which comes with distinctive social identities. And because of these, it comes with distinctive epistemic interests. So, and, and this kind of resonates, this conception of epistemic uh, uh, decolonization resonates with several kind of uh, big cheese figures in the debate, right? So, so uh, most, most importantly, it resonates with uh, Kwasi Weredu's idea uh, distinction between uh, a negative and a, and a positive program to epistemic decolonization. So he takes the, the negative program uh, to involve, and this is a, a quote, uh, the elimination from our thoughts uh, of modes of conceptualization that came to us through colonization and remain in our thinking owing to inertia rather than to our own reflective choices. Um, and uh, the positive program uh, it involves exploiting as much as is judicious, he says, the resources of our own indigenous conceptual schemes. Now, this is a very modest uh, version of epistemic decolonization. Um, epistemic decolonization, you know, conceptions come in degrees. So sometimes uh, people want to throw away every colonial influence. Quasi we read is not uh, is not like this. So you, you'll note that he says things like, as much as is judicious, um, as much as uh, you know. Uh, things that remain in, in, in our thinking or into inertia rather than choices uh, and so on. But this is at the minimum what, uh, what epistemic decolonization must involve. And, and everyone's agreed on this. So that's why I've chosen it uh, uh, mild as it is. Um, and uh, it, it's echoed by other uh, uh, more contemporary authors. So here's Ishiom Bembe more recently saying, that uh, epistemic decolonization is uh, rejecting the assumption that the modern West is the central root of Africa's consciousness and cultural heritage. Um, and so this is, the, this is, these are African ideas about what decolonization is, um, uh, but they, they're very similar to Latin American ideas, uh, such as Mignolo's epistemic disobedience, for example, um, which I mentioned uh, uh, earlier is the rejection of, of the tyranny of the zero point. Sorry, I mentioned zero point earlier, not epistemic disobedience. Um, and that simply, <clears throat> excuse me, the universalist conception of knowledge uh, that centers around a kind of Cartesian subject 
uh, that the global north suggests is the objective neutral notion of knowledge, but actually just reflects the global north's um, um, own socio-political location. Um, and so, so um, this kind of recentering is uh, by, by all um, counts uh, an ongoing project. So here's Ngugi Wationggo, for example, talks about decolonizing rather than decolonization. So it's a process. Uh, and uh, in Latin America, um, um, Kijano uh, talks about decoloniality rather than decolonization. This is all uh, um, um, meant to suggest that colonization uh, is not uh, over, right? And so decolonization is not, we're not done yet. Um, and, and the consequences uh, of this, of this, this view of, of epistemic decolonization, uh, firstly, that recentering is an ongoing uh, dynamic and, and diachronic process, um, which kind of maps and, and moves along and changes and shifts with our the changes of interse intersecting social identities and the kinds of power relations that we, the, the changing power relations in which those identities uh, enmesh us. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, there is no map between the historical end of colonialism and decolonization. Right? So we, we don't live in a post-colonial society. So I live in a country with about 30 languages, 13 of which are, 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 are official, and most of the instruction uh, at university level at least happens in English. So, uh, Colonization is, uh, colonialism is alive and well. So, so this is, um, and hence, uh, hence the, the protests of uh, five years ago. So, so this is, the, this is the, uh, the kind of conception of epistemic decolonization uh, that I'll be working with. So here's the, uh, uh, what, what I take myself to have achieved so far. Uh, not a hell of a lot. So I've just tried to sharpen up uh, the, the, the white people stuff challenge. And I've argued that there's one way of hearing that's particular, particularly troubling. Um, and that's, the, that's the, the challenge that epistemic injustice talk is somehow intrinsically marginalizing. Um, and uh, so far, I have just given you my basic idea of epistemic decolonization as a project of recentering to one's uh, geopolitical. Uh, social here and now. So now uh, for the rest of the talk, I want to uh, kind of showcase three epistemic injustice concepts and show you that they can be useful for, for epistemic decolonization by way of showing that uh, they are theoretically useful and they don't fall prey to the wh uh, white people stuff challenge. So, um, and to just spoil the, the, the show, uh, I'm going to argue that epistemic oppression is, provides us with a good descriptive diagnostic tool. The notion of white ignorance provides us with a good tool for, for uh, gauging the obstacles to epistemic decolonization. Uh, and finally, uh, the notion of contributory injustice uh, provides us with a good normative diagnostic tool. Um, now, the notion of epistemic oppression, and I don't, I don't want to uh, commit any sins of the rhetoric of beginnings, uh, but as far as I know, it was uh, Fricke who, who discussed it first, and then Dotson who, who gave it a lot more richness um, and theoretical kind of oomph. Um, and um, Dotson thinks of it as, uh, quote, the persistent infringement on one's ability to use persuasively shared epistemic resources sorry, to use persuasively shared epistemic resources for effective communication of one's experience. And by this, she means to be able to change these resources uh, as well as to be able to rely that the resources will be used fairly uh, against one for one's benefit. Um, and she gives the example of, of the way black feminist thought uh, uh, has, uh, has been uh, treated in academia. Right? So in the way it has not been uh, incorporated in the mainstream uh, body of, of feminism, and very often uh, 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 Black feminist writers have not been able to rely 
uh, on, on, first of all, they, they have not been uh, able to, to change feminist resources and to contribute to them, uh, but also they have not been uh, able to rely that these resources are used fairly uh, around them. So, um, and I, I should say here that um, Christy Dotson thought about initially, I don't think she does anymore, but uh, she thought of epistemic oppression um, exclusively as a form of marginalization and exclusion. Sorry, marginalization is fine, but exclusion. Um, whereas later writers, sorry, people later have, have argued that, uh, for example, Gail Polhouse have argued against this conception um, in, uh, of, of epistemic oppression. Um, and in particular, they've argued that certain forms of inclusion can be as epistemically oppressive as exclusion. Um, and I think that um, Linda Alkoff, although I, I don't know if, she, if she's written on this explicitly, uh, but certainly her, her suggestion uh, of an extractivist epistemology uh, would be another example of ways in which epistemic oppression, uh, sorry, forms of inclusion can be epistemically oppressive as well as exclusion. But, but regardless of where your bread is buttered on this one, um, I wanted to just persuade you here that this notion of epistemic oppression, no matter how you conceive of it, uh, it is a really useful descriptive diagnostic tool for epistemic decolonization. And in particular, I think that considerations of epistemic oppression um, uh, can be useful by, by, because they place the experiences distinctive of the colonized, uh, uh, at the center of the knowledge enterprise. So, um, and, and, and by so doing, they, they also make it clear why it is a moral and epistemic wrong to marginalize uh, the resources of the colonized. So um, I take it that uh, this, this idea that changing, changing the resources, uh, you're unable when you're epistemically oppressed, you're unable to, uh, to, to change the, the dominant resources is an epistemic ill. Uh, and then uh, your right to rely that these resources are used fairly against you is, is a moral uh, right, I think. And so the infringement of that right, uh, again, right is probably the wrong language uh, in this context, but the infringement of that right is a moral wrong. Um, so, so, and if that's right, so if, if epistemic oppression um, can tell us what's morally and epistemically wrong with marginalizing uh, co uh, uh, colonized resources, then I think that the notion of epistemic oppression uh, provides a very plausible rationale for, uh, for decolonization. And remember, I understand decolonization is recentering. So here's my, my stick man version, stick person version uh, of decolonization uh, as the rec the, is reclaiming the right and ability to think and theorize from your own geographical and sociocultural location. Um, in epistemic, the notion of epistemic oppression can tell us why we should be, uh, why we have this right. Um, in fact, I say that it's a useful descriptive, di descriptive diagnostic tool, but um, <clears throat> I, I would, if I were a feeling a little bit braver, uh, I would argue that it's also ne a necessary uh, uh, tool of this kind. Uh, in particular, any, any uh, rationale for uh, epistemic decolonization uh, that misses talk of, or that doesn't feature talk of epistemic oppression, I think would be a, a poorer story to tell that one that does feature epistemic oppression. But um, I'm not going to be feeling brave and I'm not going to argue for this here. Um, what I had to show you, remember, is that um, uh, what I promised was that not only that these epistemic injustice tools are, are sharp ones, but they're also safe. So by which I meant that uh, not only are they theoretical fruit, theoretically fruitful, but also they're not prone to the white person stuff challenge. And I think that that should be uh, hopefully obvious uh, that they're not. So that epistemic oppression is not in any case, uh, because it's clearly uh, talk of epistemic oppression is precisely concerned with the perspective of the marginalized, right? So it's, uh, it's defined as the persistent infringement, infringement on one's ability to use shared resources. Uh, and one here is uh, for a change, not the dominant one. Um, so that is 
uh, essentially the, the, the notion of epistemic oppression centers around uh, the, 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 well, the oppressed perspective. Uh, and likewise, and when I explained why, um, why uh, considerations of epistemic oppression are useful for, for, for epistemic decolonization, uh, again, uh, I, I, thought, I thought of it in terms of placing the marginalized resources at the center of the knowledge enterprise. So, so um, epistemic oppression is, is concerned precisely with the, with the perspective of the oppressed. Um, indeed, uh, it actually allows us to spell out the, the white person stuff challenge uh, in better terms. So we can spell it out like this. If, so the challenge is that epistemic injustice discourse obscures marginalized experiences by excluding them from the communal epistemic uh, resource or bank or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and if that's right, then, then we kind of boost the notion's theoretical, uh, theoretical fruitfulness credentials. But also uh, what we show is that if that's the case, then it's highly unlikely that thinking about epistemic oppression would be adopting an intrinsically, intrinsically marginalizing uh, point of view. Uh, and so uh, we show that uh, this notion, at least, in the epistemic injustice literature, is not prone to the white person stuff challenge. So that's my first showcase notion. The next one uh, is uh, White Ignorance uh, by, uh, this is Charles Mills, who passed away earlier this year, uh, to, to the great loss uh, of philosophy. And um, so I, I find his notion of white ignorance uh, incredibly uh, theoretically fruitful and, and I'll, so much so that I'll have to, I, yeah, I'll, I'll have to contain myself with all the directions in which I find it theoretically fruitful. So I'll just think about how it could be uh, used in, in the context of epistemic decolonization. And so, I mean, if you've, hopefully you've all read this paper uh, of, Mills, of Mills's, uh, but and he, he there is very careful about distinguishing very, various features of white ignorance. But let me just focus, and it's a complex notion, but let me just focus here uh, on the core ones that will allow me uh, to make my point. So uh, Mills defines white ignorance as a non-knowing that is not contingent, but in which race, white racism and or white racial domination and their ramifications plays a crucial causal role. Um, and what, they, what he means by this is, um, I mean, various, so the, the various qualifications to what he means by um, causal mechanisms, um, sorry, by, by, he, by causal role. Sorry, I just had like a weird pop-up thing saying that you can now all see my, uh, my application. I hope, presumably you've all been seeing my, my screen. You did give me the thumbs up, so. Yeah, we, we can see you, <laughs> see the screen, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so, 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 so the first thing is that he says is that the causal mechanisms of uh, the, race, the racist causal mechanisms involved um, are socio-structural rather than biological because, well, because well, most people are now uh, social constructivists uh, about race. Um, he also says that, that not any ignorance of white people uh, matters, so white ignorance is not for example, it's not my uh, ignorance of, of Twitter or whatever. So I don't know how Twitter stuff works uh, and I'm white, but like, it, that's not it, right? Uh, but rather uh, it, has to be, it has to be racially motivated by, by some form of racism. Um, and he says, I think perhaps, perhaps rather generously to individuals that this kind of racialized causality should be understood broadly. So both at the, at the individual level where individuals have responsibility for it, but sometimes uh, also just structurally. So that it may be that a, a, a particular white person who is ignorant, uh, white ignorance, um, is, not, uh, is not complicit in this ignorance. So this is not a blameworthy kind of ignorance. I, I think he's wrong about this, but, but anyway, that, that's, that's the, the, big, the big picture. Um, and then white ignorance can range over a whole spectrum of beliefs, right? So from the very uh, descriptive beliefs such as um, ignorance about uh, routine and institutionalized police brutality towards black people to more ethically um, thick kind of beliefs uh, such as 
the mysterious belief some people have that uh, black and white people have equal socioeconomic opportunities to outright moral judgments, such as color blindness is not racism, but a way of overcoming it. Uh, another, another belief that some, some white people mysteriously hold still to this day. Um, so, so, so these are the kinds of beliefs, kinds of beliefs that it can range over. And, and this is very, very interesting, I think, but, but I won't talk about it. He treats this as a form of group irrationality, white ignorance. So he thinks that it's not, obviously, it's not driven by uh, evidence. Beliefs formed in, in white ignorance are not uh, responsive to the evidence. Uh, they're driven by, by group interest. And then here's the really scary thing that, that it, white ignorance affects all areas of, of a white person's cognition. So, um, and here his, his terms for, for the four areas, conception, he says, perception, memory, and testimony. And just to give you a, a, a little idea of how it affects conception, what he calls conception. Um, so historically, uh, it plays itself out uh, in categories such as the savage, uh, the idea that people, white people discovered empty lands, the notion of civilizing, all of these concepts um, are ways in which uh, white ignorance uh, uh, manifests uh, itself in, in vicious ways. And, um, and nowadays, uh, of course, we have our equivalents of these things, uh, such as colorblindness. Uh, Mill says it's subtler, I'm not sure how much subtler it is, but um, I guess there's a point to that. And, and colorblindness is uh, a wonderfully potent tool for maintaining white hegemony. So it, it amounts to conceptual, the conceptual erasure of white privilege. Um, and of course, of the advantage uh, uh, of, white, of white people that the white people enjoy through this emphasis on, on individual achievement um, and the self-made self uh, man. Um, and, and this kind of erasure is erasing the very thing that's responsible for white flourishing, right? So uh, black bodies and their suffering uh, through slavery, through, colonial, through colonialism, uh, through current, this is continued current disadvantage, uh, both, both in Africa and, and in the former colonies, uh, and, and so on, sorry, in, in the former uh, colonizers of countries. Uh, and, and the thing about white privilege is that it, it keeps uh, the white person free of guilt, innocent, you know, the good father, the good husband, uh, all of these lovely things, uh, and, um, and free of debt. So this is just one way in which um, uh, white ignorance plays itself uh, in, in, in uh, white people's uh, cognition. Now, I think that white ignorance is a really uh, theoretically very fruitful tool for understanding resistance to, to epistemic uh, decolonization. So I have no idea why to this day, uh, as I said, you know, epistemic decolonization is not over. It's not, uh, it, it's, it's very much still, uh, sorry, epistemic colonization is still very much with us, right? So we still teach in, in uh, colonial languages. We still, our curricula are full of, of, uh, of the global norths. Uh, basically our curricula are identical pretty much to, to the global north. Um, and, and, and one would think, well, wh why after all of these years of, of uh, freedom, why would we still uh, have, have this kind of uh, problem? Why, why are we still epistemically colonized? And I think uh, white ignorance might be a, a very uh, good explanation for this to a great extent. Um, although Elvis and I were earlier talking about uh, the situation in certain countries where the white person is no longer there, but the, the colonial kind of frames continue to, to self-perpetuate. And, and maybe, maybe for, for that kind of thing, uh, then that wouldn't be such a helpful tool. Uh, but certainly for, for a country like, like mine, uh, it, I think it would be very, very, very helpful to explain uh, why we still are epistemically colonized. Um, and moreover, the theoretical fruitfulness uh, of, of, uh, of this concept uh, also extends to, to helping explain the white person stuff challenge to begin with, right? So you can, 
um, you can, it helps us situate it in a larger kind of framework, a conceptual framework of, of self-perpetuation, of illegitimate epistemic authority. Um, and that is uh, Georg Pohlhauser's notion of willful hermeneutical ignorance. And so that's the kind of deliberate ignorance. And it's not just now about race, uh, but uh, deliberate ignorance of resistant epistemic resources that help maintain uh, one's self-arrogated uh, epistemic authority. So that's the way in which I think that uh, epistemic decolonization, uh, sorry, that white ignorance is a, is a useful tool. And again, I'm not gonna be brave enough to, uh, to argue that it's a necessary one, but, but uh, I thought I'd just uh, stick it in there in case someone is. Um, and remember, I'm, I'm always trying to show that it's fruitful, but also that it's not liable to the, to the uh, white person stuff challenge. Um, and again, I don't think that it is, right? So it's um, concerned precisely with, with the perspective of the marginalized and coming from it, right? Uh, although, I mean, th there is an odd ring to this because it is about the white person, right? And the ignorance, right? But, but I think that um, it's not a surprise that, that it didn't come, the concept didn't come from a white person. Um, so, um, so I think that, that it really is concerned with the perspective of the marginalized and the way that that perspective is erased in, in through white ignorance. Um, and I think it gives more theoretical oomph to the, to the uh, uh, white person's stuff challenge, as I as already mentioned. mentioned. Uh, it, it really gives it kind of psychological uh, plausibility. Why, you know, what, it explains why the white person stuff is a real possibility and a real danger. Uh, and what we need to do if we're going to keep our epistemic injustice discourse free uh, or invulnerable to this challenge, what we need to do. Um, uh, and that is to overcome white ignorance. So it's just not a, uh, we're not in, in the game yet if we don't do that. Uh, so given this, it's very unlikely that it will be uh, marginalizing, intrinsically marginalizing. And so uh, it should not be prone to the white person stuff challenge. So this was the, the second um, um, concept that I, that I, I thought was uh, useful. And finally, the third epistemic injustice concept uh, that I think is useful is, is that of contributory injustice. In contributory injustice, so what you get is what you get when you put together epistemic oppression and um, um, willful hermeneutical ignorance. Um, and this, is like, this is the situation in which uh, the marginalized epistemic resources uh, not only um, uh, are being sidelined, but when, when they try and join the, 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 the main knowledge economy, they don't get the necessary uptake, uh, partly because of will, willful hermeneutical ignorance. And so they never come into the knowledge economy. And so then, then it's a vicious circle, vicious circle of, uh, of uh, reinforcing the, the obscurity of these resources because now no one is uh, allowing them in, so we don't understand what you mean when you use the notion of white ignorance. Um, um, and that further marginalizes you and excludes you from, from the process of knowledge production. And moreover, it makes you un in, unable to effectively combat the epistemic oppression uh, that led here and the, my willful hermeneutical ignorance, my being the, the dominant um, knowledge. Um, and again, I think that this is a very fruitful notion for, for epistemic decolonization. Uh, in particular, it's helpful for spelling out, I think, the core epistemic injustice of epistemic injustice, right? Not moral injustice, obviously, of epistemic decolonization. So it's the exclusion of marginalized, resor marginalized resources, the, the, their relegation to witchcraft and uh, su superstition and so on the exclusion from the main economy uh, that, uh, that um, uh, is the contributory injustice, the core injustice of epistemic decolonization. Um, and I think that, uh, again, contributory injustice, thinking about contributory, in terms of contributory injustice, is not prone to the white person stuff challenge, uh, not, to, not to spell out the obvious, uh, so to spell out the obvious, 
uh, again, the perspective is entirely uh, that of the marginalized. And again, it, it's so much so that it can help us uh, spell out the white person stuff, the challenge itself. So it, it pins down why it would be epistemically wrong uh, if epistemic, the epistemic injustice literature were intrinsically marginalized. So the wrong would be that we can't combat epistemic uh, oppression uh, and willful hermeneutical ignorance. And the reason why it's a distinctively epistemic wrong is because we, we, we're doing so by, by being excluded from uh, the main epistemic enterprise. Um, and that's the fact that it helps uh, spell out the white uh, person stuff challenge, of course, boosts again, it's theoretically fruitful credentials. Uh, but also, uh, if, if it's, uh, if it's uh, adopting the perspective of the marginalized, again, I don't think it can be intrinsically marginalizing. And so it can be prone to the white person staff challenge. Um, this is not really a conclusion, it's more of a summary. So what I want to, uh, uh, what I've tried to argue here is that at least some epistemic injustice tools are theoretically useful or even necessary. Uh, any story about epistemic decolonization and I've kind of gestured at um, the white person staff challenge itself would be poorer without using uh, these tools. Uh, and those tools are theoretically useful without uh, at least these three tools, uh, without falling prey to the white person staff challenge. Um, and I did this by first finding the, the harshest possible challenge in, in the idea that the epistemic injustice literature somehow is intrinsically marginalizing, the perspective it adopts is marginalizing. Um, and then I, I thought of epistemic decolonization in terms of an ongoing project of recentering re the knowledge enterprise to ones here and now. Um, <clears throat> and, then, um, and then I discussed epistemic oppression, white ignorance and contributory injustice. And hopefully uh, you're persuaded that at least those three tools uh, are useful, uh, sorry, are sharp uh, and safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Veli. Um, yeah, as usual, very, very insightful and um, uh, very rich, uh, the way you've um, uh, carefully structured your, your presentation, argued for the fact that there are tools within epistemic injustice that are definitely um, relevant and can um, uh, be defended against the white people stuff argument, essentially. Um, so I'll, I'll now leave the uh, floor open for questions. So if you have questions, please um, uh, you can raise your hand, your digital hand, or you can put the question on the chat as well. Happy to take them. Um, so I would like to start with the subject head for the World Philosophies Program, Dr. Sean Hawthorne. Uh, thank you, Vali. I, I just so enjoyed um, your discussion in this um, paper and, um, you know, having done a lot of work on um, Dotson, I found, you know, um, Lewis Gordon's phrase, you know, white people stuff really quite extraordinary. Um, and it makes me wonder whether he's not doing black women's um, stuff. Uh, that said, <laughs> as much as I like Gordon's work and I, I I, I really do. The one thing that I was kind of questioning and wondering um, throughout your paper, and, and it's beautiful and elegant and, and wonderfully laid out um, argument. Um, and also, please kind of have a tutorial from you and how to kind of do the things you were doing with your, your slides. Um, was if epistemic injustice is not merely white person's stuff, um, and the aim is to try and place at the center of knowledge those epistemologies and those ways of understanding and knowing the world from those who have traditionally or historically and, and continually are um, marginalized or oppressed from having a full share in, in epistemic contestation and, and articulation and so on, uh, who does this placing? at the center um, of knowledge. Um, 
don't we also, whilst confronting white ignorance, also need to confront that white savior um, complex? That that must also be part of um, the analysis. White ignorance is not the only problem here. It's also, and I think this comes through also in, in Dobson's argument uh, and, and also Hill Collins' um, argument about this kind of incorporation of um, criticisms that then become part of how whiteness kind of saves itself and, and reasserts its kind of beneficence and its goodness and, and so on and so forth. Um, I think that's what I would love to hear you talk a bit more about is when we recognize that epistemic injustice as a kind of set of theoretical tools has this function, who does this work? Um, and how do we get rid of the white savior, who's of course then in the place of being able to allow this to happen? Um, thanks so much for, for this great question uh, and, and for your kind words. Uh, I think it's a very, a very difficult issue and, and one that my my students and I are forever fighting and, and debating about and uh, it's it's actually wonderful. I, I think the first thing is that um, yeah we, we certainly need to listen. <laughs> Why, you know so so the white person's function only comes insofar as if we don't listen then we're all stuck right so <laughs> um, uh, Th that's certainly not to say that that we're going to have like some kind of savior function in all of this. Uh, on the other hand, it is to say that uh, there's there's a white people still have a lot of power, and if they don't do something about this, then nothing will get done about this. Simply because, uh, and and my students are so frustrated. Like after all these years, we're still going around the same circles, right? So I mean, my black students, my, most of my students, For are sure. black. Yeah. Um, and. And uh, so if you look at, at faculties and so on, uh, the, the, the professors are, are mostly white, right? So there's no, it doesn't need uh, uh, any magic or any genius to, to work out that unless these professors do something, uh, we're going to be like in the backwaters of, of colonization forever and ever. Yeah. Um, so it's a very, it's a very delicate uh, uh, game to play, right? In, in terms of how much, uh, um, the white person has to do, uh, and so, so I, as far as I'm I'm concerned, um, I take the responsibility to be guided by my students and my black colleagues in, into what I need to be doing because the other uh, dangerous side of it is epistemic exploitation, right? So, and that's one one concept that I also wanted to discuss. In fact, that's the one that this mysterious person I uh, mentioned to, to Lewis Gordon in, 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 the, uh, in the discussion. Uh, the other thing is saying, okay, like, I don't understand this stuff. It's your experiences. Tell me how to do it, please, you know? Uh, and that's no, no better than the, than the white person um, uh, uh, um, savior complex. So uh, very delicate. I don't have the answer, uh, I, but I can tell you what, what I feel responsible for, and um, and I always ask my my black colleagues and my black students to help in a way. Hopefully, that's not you know help guide me in a way that's not epistemically exploitative. Yeah, I think you know there is that hard line before between foregrounding whilst not exploiting and not requiring um, our Black colleagues and our and our colleagues of color to do the work for us, whilst nonetheless being secure in our positions, and um, you know, proceeding as though we're the good white people. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate the dilemma um, very much. I think it's really good for us to have these conversations. So thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thank you very for your answer. Um, let's have um, Andrew. Thanks, Elvis, and thank you very so much for your talk. Um, this might follow on from Dr. Hawthorne's question. I was just reflecting as you were talking, I really, really was interested in the distinction between decolonizing versus decolonization. And I was struck by kind of, you know, the, the fact that the nature of the mind and our understanding, you know, knowledge is always a process. Um, but I, I guess 
my question is about this contrast because your talks about epistemic injustice and i was i was reflecting on how you know knowledge always has to be a process because the nature is how our minds work and yet you know there's a certain luxury of 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 reflection and of knowledge and whenever you're in the space of of um of theorizing and you you've used the phrase you know some of these tools are theoretically useful or even necessary and yet this is a very luxurious um position and yet some of the peoples and situations need justice yesterday and so i think the reason i'm asking this question is it, it's it's not so much a criticism it's more of a live question for myself about the tension between on the one hand the fact that decolonizing is a process and the nature of knowledge is a, is a process um, and that we're talking in the realm of theory we're, we're on the other hand we, we are dealing with concrete real world situations that our students and colleagues are in um, and I'm not entirely sure about where one stops and the other begins so it's a, it's a, it's a messy question but I just didn't know if you had any comments on this juxtaposition thanks again thanks thanks Andrew um, I, yeah, I guess my 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 gut response is that it's that the that it's a strange juxtaposition. Uh, so so to my mind, uh, decolonizing is precisely um, a process in which. So 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 maybe I just misunderstood this this business of the luxury reflection or uh, the the luxury of reflection and so on. But to me, the knowledge process and the decolonizing process must be. Well, pull together because decolonization is sorry, epistemic decolonization is precisely about the way our knowledge uh, uh, develops at the moment, the practical situations which uh, marginalized people face, the, the very ones that you're saying. So you're saying on the one hand there's decolonization, on the other hand there are these very practical situations, and I. I don't know that they're precisely these kinds of practical situations are precisely the kind of the dynamic uh, um, diachronic thing. Sorry, I was looking for the word diachronic. Uh, that that forms our epistemic identities and our larger larger social identities. And so, epistemic decolonization needs to keep in step with this. So. So maybe I just misunderstood the contrast you were drawing. I, I probably did a terrible job of explaining myself. So let me just try briefly again, um, and then we can drop it if I'm just modeling this. But I think I was reflecting on the fact that, um, you know, you've talked about useful or necessary theoretical tools, um, but that that's um, there's a there's a difference between the space of knowledge and theory and this and the, and the realm of action. And I'm not saying the two don't go together. But I, I'm, I'm, I was reflecting on the, the difference between knowledge and action, basically. And I was kind of asking about where you see that line to be drawn and where we might have to go. We have useful tools theoretically, but that doesn't necessarily get us justice that these people may have needed yesterday. Um, it's, it's necessarily, yeah. So I think that's, I don't know if that's any clearer at all. Yeah, thank you. No, no, I, I don't think it was you being unclear. I think that I, was, uh, I wasn't picking it up. So. Um, Maybe because, because our conception, our kind of analytic Anglo-American conception of knowledge is already this kind of disembodied theoretical, purely theoretical thing. Um, and maybe that's why the, the contrast looks starker. Uh, but I also hear you from, from the point of view of like, you know, sitting here talking about pretty tools is not going to help anyone in real life. Um, but on the other hand, without talking about these pretty tools, uh, uh, we're not going to make any progress either. And this is where I chickened out of of, uh, of making the stronger claim that these are necessary uh, tools. But I think something like, um, so I was reading this paper by Emmeline Davis uh, uh, a week or two ago, and, and and she was saying so. There's there's another kind of objection to the epistemic injustice literature, which is like, look. You've already granted that these are structural problems. You already, you've already granted that these are problems to do with action, as you put it, uh, uh, and to, to do with practical uh, situations and practical discrepancy, not practical, but you know, like um, economic discrepancies and, and all sorts of other marginalizations, right? 
then why don't we just fix those? You know, like these inequalities, why don't we fix those and forget about this fluffy stuff talking about epistemic injustice? And his response, and sorry, his, his, her response is to say, unless you're going to foreground the perspective of the marginalized and you're going to talk about epistemic injustice, then you'll never be able to address these, these uh, structural, material, economic, whatever problems. Um, and this kind of like is a, a um, but, but that, that's all to say that, that uh, it's necessary to think about these things. It's not to say that it's sufficient. And as you say, a lot of the problems need to have been fixed, not yesterday, yesteryear, right? And um, yes, the same, five centuries ago. But yeah, uh, so, that, so that's my- that. Yeah, that really clarifies, yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, and we'll have Benedita. Thank you for your patience, Benedita. I'm sorry, Good afternoon, I everyone, and thank you for the talk, Professor. Um, so my question was actually partially answered already in this conversation between you and Andrew, but it was I was interested towards the end of the presentation when you were um, asking why are we still why is there still um why are we still colonized epistemologically right you had those slides with kind of questions and one of the answers that was coming up is because of white ignorance and kind of as a gut feeling listening to those questions my reaction would have been because of white hegemony not ignorance so i was kind of wondering like in, in a way, this I think relates a bit to this debate you were having with Andrew about this, you know, the two realms. But of course, the epistemic colonialism follows the structure of of a, an economy, a world, a society that is still highly colonized, racialized. So, in a way, I wonder why the answer fell on ignorance more than on the structures of power and how they are still highly racialized. Yeah, I think you were right that that I've only partially answered that question, right? So, and I think that, um, um, I mean, to a great extent, because we're talking about epistemic decolonization, whatever hegemony we're talking about is epistemic hegemony, right? And I think that that white ignorance is a brilliant mechanism for perpetuating that hegemony, that epistemic hegemony, right? Um, and, and I think that, I mean, so, so maybe, I mean, there comes a point with many people when, when, I, when, when I discuss issues with many people of, of various persuasions, um, there comes a point at which we, we kind of start thump, thump, thumping the table about the importance of epistemic considerations and their priority, right? Um, and, and maybe that's what's, so it's, I don't have a very satisfying response to that kind of uh, question, right? My intuition is that there is a distinctive problem here. There is a distinctive epistemic dimension to, coloni to colonization, and therefore a distinctive, distinctively epistemic liberation struggle that we need to be having, partly for the reasons, the Emmeline Davis reasons that I, I spelled out. Um, because if you don't see the problem clearly, you're not gonna fix it clearly. Uh, Clearly, you're not going to fix it, right? Um, um, so, so to me, white white ignorance is. I mean, I was going to say just a mechanism for the perpetuation of epistemic hegemony, but I don't think so because I think that it's to a great extent through the the story we tell ourselves, uh, we allow uh, uh, these material structures to persist, right? Who got the scholarship again? Oh, look, it's the white guy, right? Um, how did we do this? Well, we tell the story about uh, how he was the only deserving ca candidate, right? He was the best. Um, this is a material change, right? Because all his black colleagues now didn't get the scholarship. So these things do get, do, do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a, not a, a very clean streamlined answer, but Sorry, just to I liked very much how you answered to Andrew, which is about how those I mean perspectives have to be taken into consideration for material decolon. I mean, I think I really liked this idea about I mean how the kind of structure and superstructure relate in this conversation of 
So you can't even challenge the structure without decolonial perspectives. I mean, I think that's exactly uh, uh, very good. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and yeah, and I think I we can't really explain our, our current lived experiences in terms of practice, what is really happening, our experiences uh, as completely separate from the theories and concepts that were created 300 years ago. And, uh, you know, um, they were sort of theoretical at that point, uh, theories about race. And, and as um, Charles Mills uh, talked about in terms of how white ignorance affects cognition in terms of conceptions, concepts that were formulated and how they continue to affect and influence um, uh, the uh, people's life. and. Um, continue to sustain margin, marginalization. Um, and I think it's also part of the Western problem to, con, to want to maintain these hegemonies, uh, sorry, these binaries between theory and practice, between, yeah, um, which obviously is not always the case. And, and that brings me to uh, one quick question. Um, if if um, white ignorance does um, affect cognition, in particular conception, the concepts that were created, uh, civilized and barbaric, uh, primitive and scientific and, and stuff like that. Uh, discovering new worlds when those places were already there, having their cultures and so on. Why is it that we continue to use um, some of those concepts? Isn't it, isn't it part of um, um, doing away with this um, epistemic oppression by rejecting those concepts, particularly if they continue to influence our experiences. And I'm, and I'm particularly interested with, in these two concepts, which is really part of my current research now, uh, whiteness and blackness. Um, whiteness and blackness obviously are constructions uh, to describe race. I don't think I've seen a white person or a black person anywhere really, uh, literally as it were. Why do we continue to use them even when we are trying to use them to overcome uh, epistemic oppression? Uh, why do those concepts continue to feature? Okay, just a quick question, he says. <laughs> uh, right, well, so, I mean, obviously I could run through the, the, the general arguments and uh, in, the, in the reductionist, non-reductionist debate, but sorry, not, uh, not reductionist. What are people who wanted to do away with race, the eliminativists? Um, uh, I think that, I mean, I'll just tout out the standard one, which is, which is also my, my feeling on the subject, because otherwise we can't name these injustices. Because doing away with these concepts would be like me saying, uh, I can't see color. And it would be extremely convenient for me to not be able to see color, um, because then I can be feeling very good about myself and how I'm a self-made woman. So that I think that that's, that's why. So yeah. presumably one day, so it's a very standard answer, I'm afraid I don't have mm -hmm. anything more inside. And that, 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 that's, exactly what, that's exactly what I expected. But, but my, <laughs> my, my thought is why don't we reconceptualize? Why don't we form um, less violent concepts as it were. Why don't we use new concepts? I'm not saying the concept should be completely done away with, but why don't we re-represent and reconceptualize and reconstruct in ways that are more inclusive and diverse as it were, yeah. Because I don't think we, we're there yet. I think we need to be in a far better society before we can afford to do this. We need the ugliness of whiteness to attach. And the, and the justified uh, violence to, to attach to the black concept, right? I've had enough. My students tell me I've had enough. No one listens, right? Um, and the only way is violence, right? And, and that goes with a long history of patience and waiting and being, um, sorry, I'm trying to find a polite uh, way of putting it, oppressed, sorry. Um, and, so just we, that we don't do that. mind we don't mind swearing in this world. <laughs> <laughs> that will be very unworldly uh, philosophy uh, stuff. But but yeah, so 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 um, yeah, I 
I think that hopefully one day we can reconceptualize these uh, these concepts when these races have different histories and different standings in relation to each other. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Uh, um, Peter, Ikane, your hand was up. I don't know if you still um, want to go ahead with your question before Sean. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, Professor Feli. Uh, uh, the, the talk was quite and engaging and very interesting. Um, I just I just wanted to know um, uh, because uh, well from your talk and perhaps from uh, other uh, similar um, um, presentations that I've attended, uh, the, the discussion on uh, epistemic injustice, and of course, um, epistemic decolonization, uh, are always around. Uh, like the this was pointing out, always around the binaries of. Uh, of whiteness and blackness, in, you know, <clears throat> in the, the whole talk of race. So, so I was just wondering whether uh, we can begin to talk about epistemic injustice and even reverse spread to um, epistemic decolonization, if you like decolonization, uh, without necessarily referring to um, you know, this binary of whiteness and blackness. Now, now I'm asking this question because um, in some of the examples you pointed to, um, I see uh, similar scenarios play out uh, in my own uh, very lived experience uh, without necessarily having uh, the sort of binaries you talk about whiteness and blackness being you know, in that kind of place. So I'm still able to um, see how epistemic injustice uh, and the whole talk of decolonization, more of that speak to that experience uh, because like you said during the talk, some of these structures are still in place. So um, so the question is, do I, uh, will, will epistemic injustice um, and epistemic decolonization have uh, conceptual relevance without uh, reference to um, the whole um, race binary of whiteness and blackness? Or in the case of uh, speaking for like in my own context where we don't have that you know, whiteness and blackness, we, hope we need a whole new uh, set of concepts to begin to understand uh, what goes on in that kind of space. Thanks, Peter, and good to see you again. Um, I'm not, I mean, so when you say, you know, that these concepts speak to your experiences, obviously I can't presume to know what the experiences are. Um, uh, well, do you mind if I could just uh, speak a little bit about my experience? Sure, okay, I mean, so, I could so, quickly so, uh, uh, objectify uh, so, you, but it, it uh, so, would probably be better for you to do it, yeah. Uh, okay, so, so um, I'm talking about, um, maybe uh, I think uh, Dr. Elvis would, <laughs> would know this a little bit, uh, because we talked about, you know, ethnicism, you know, as uh, smaller cycles of racism. And so uh, the kind of belief I have is, in fact, I often, I often share this with, with people that, that as long as, as, as you, that, that the further you go away from, uh, what you may call your 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 tribal uh, home, as it were, uh, the the more or the 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 extent to which you feel this kind of uh, marginalization. So uh, if right now I'm not in uh, what you call my tribal home, I'm in a different location. I, I come from um, uh, what you, what usually referred to as the minority groups in in Nigeria, minority tribe. I'm not Yoruba, I'm not Igbo, I'm not Hausa. So when people talk about the tribes in Nigeria, you say Igbo, Hausa, and Yoruba. So I'm not from that, from any of these. But where I work, I still experience, you know, what you could describe as some form of injustice, uh, so some form of marginalization. And I don't see color, I don't see, I don't see the binaries of whiteness and blackness. But yet uh, these concepts you use speak to that. So, so, so that's what the kind of thing I'm, I'm talking about. So I'm away from my tribal home. I experience this. I think we may have lost Peter. Sorry, Peter, were you? I think we lost him, but perhaps it's enough for you to go. <laughs> yeah, sure. but you know, I don't want to be answering just to you guys yeah. without he asked the uh, question. Peter, can you hear us?
I mean, yeah, it's not as though I would solve his problems, but uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so perhaps Sean can ask has as well, and, and then okay. you might start. Uh, I mean, in many ways, it's somewhat related. I don't think it's necessary on the way to an answer to what I think Peter has actually very poignantly laid out. And that is the kind of degrees of separation or the, the kind of entanglement in various forms of structures of power that, that produce marginalization that can't be captured within black and white. Um, but I've been doing a lot of kind of thinking and reading um, around the work that's come out of Afro pessimism recently, and um, uh, you know, and there's a different binary at work there that they're identifying, which is that between you know the human, which is the kind of producer of knowledge and and all the other things that humans produce, and then the slave or the kind of um, non-human. Um, and, and people like Frank B. Wilderson are effectively arguing that what we need is not necessarily an analysis of epistemic injustice. We need to recognize that that system is always already epistemically unjust. Uh, what we need is to quote an epistemological catastrophe. And that is the only thing that is really going to change these dynamics, these, these kind of binarizations, these conceptualities, this cognition, this white ignorance, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and I'm kind of wondering what you would think about that. I mean, of course, they're pessimistic because they are realist as well. They, they recognize that there's really nothing that is going to persuade structures of whiteness to allow such an epistemological catastrophe to happen. But that in itself, I think, is quite um, quite sobering when it comes to the confrontation with epistemic injustice, because presumably, well, I would think that the epistemic injustice, in fact, is so serious that it calls for an epistemological catastrophe. Yeah, so I'm not familiar with the with the notion of epistemological catastrophe. So, so what what exactly do we what what exactly needs to to happen? That uh, it would be. Uh, that the kind of epistemological systems that are so entrenched within uh, particularly white ways of thinking and being and moving in the world um, would have to be so entirely dismantled that all of the conceptual apparatus that goes along with that, the entire libraries that kind of support it, mandate it, perpetuate it, disseminate it, would have to effectively be destroyed in order for, in fact, epistemic, uh, epistemic justice to be delivered. And for that decentering and recentering and decolonization and, and for that fundamental binary of the human and the slave, the human and the inhuman to no longer be the dominating paradigm in which which under, kind of underpins the, the division between the knower and the known. That would all have to be completely destroyed for there to be justice. So I guess as, as someone, if, if we have the intellectual integrity, <laughs> then, right. then that would probably be the way to go. Um, I don't know if I have the intellectual integrity to, 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 to give, so, so I'm, I'm, I would, but this would be this would come out this terrible to, to say like let a thousand flowers bloom right because you know that's the whole point that some some are weeds and we got to get rid of them before anything blooms so I assume that's the the, the point of uh, epistemic catastrophes so um, um, I kind of think like actually they're saying that it's all weeds and until yeah I see okay yeah it's a kind of burn the whole thing down um, argument such that a thousand flowers can bloom, but they won't be, you know, the tulips of the Netherlands and they won't be the English roses <laughs> and so on and so forth, right? The, yeah. Okay, so so the, then the, in, in, in that spirit, I, I should say that I'm, I'm equally fond of, of Proteus as I am of tulips. So like I, uh, but, but that's a personal thing. And I, I think that if we were to be, uh, to mean what we say, then that's probably the way to go. Although then the, the wonder is from where 
uh, I mean, you don't just get flowers to grow from a fellow field, right? You need some something, no. someone to grow them. Some but seeds. Think, uh, a, a burnt and charcoal field can actually be very good for. <laughs> hard, no. anyway i i want to actually um take us back to peter because i think what he had to say was a bit more important <laughs> no no but I, no i mean then gardening no, since, you know <laughs> uh but um no so so i want to go back there as well but yeah so the answer to your question i think is that and this this speaks to something i mentioned about the kind of spectrum of your conception of epistemic decolonization i think as well right so the one that I was playing with here was a very moderate one, but you know, if you go the other way, it's go. <laughs> and, and I think that that is the honest way to go, actually. Um, um, but yeah, Peter, are you, are you able to hear us? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, so I think um, that's just what I was just trying to, uh, the, the context from which I was speaking from. No, thank, thanks. Thanks for that clarification. So, I mean, so it's it's a. This is why I paused mid sentence because only five minutes earlier we talked with uh, with Elvis precisely about the Nigerian situation, and and it's more complicated than because what you seem to be describing is a kind of, um, I guess one. I mean, a lot of xenophobia victims of xenophobia would have this kind of thing as well, and it's part of it's part of the except that it's your country, right? So, I mean, I don't know whether it makes it better or worse, or right? Um, and, um, and, but that's why I paused when, uh, when I was thinking of, of uh, our conversation earlier with Elvis, because um, in Nigeria, and some of my students are Nigerian, and, they, um, and they've, they've told me about this, that it's not just what you described, there's another thing, and there's like deep-rooted colonial roots of, of um, I think Professor Hawthorne has gotten me thinking about plants now. So deep, deep seated um, colonial influences that that um, uh, uh, play out themselves in weird ways. Like, um, like even though there are no white people in Nigeria anymore, um, Nigerian uh, little kids are not allowed to speak uh, any of the native uh, languages in in schools and so on. So, so they. So I, I like I, I can't really presume to understand the kinds of things that you're experiencing from that angle as well as the one that you mentioned because those two must like really come together uh, and 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 become a Mozilla of a problem, not just uh, in America. Uh, and I don't think that uh, we need the language of black and white to describe those problems, although a lot of people argue that these sorts of tribalisms uh, are, are to a great extent the colonial legacy because, I mean, but, but that of course then puts the white person back center stage, which, which is what we're trying to move away from. Uh, so we, we don't need to talk about these things um, in, in terms of black and white, um, uh, but we do need to talk about them, something that Professor Hawthorne mentioned as well as in terms of power relations. And I think that, um, so entrain, entrenched power relations uh, of the kind that you're describing sound very similar. Uh, and, and these uh, similar power relations uh, were described by, uh, uh, by feminists and so on. So what, not, not similar, but, but you know what I mean. So, so epistemic injustice concerns can run across various social identities um, and they get very complex when these uh, social identities intermix in, in particularly bad ways, like when you, for example, a black woman, right? <laughs> then, then you really become like, then it's like not Godzilla, but like whatever is the next problem up uh, of, 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 a, uh, uh, of complication and, and, and disempowerment. Um, but I do think, so while we don't have to talk about black and white for, for the purposes of epistemic injustice, we obviously have to talk about black and white in, for the purposes of epistemic decolonization, we do have to talk about social identities and power relations. Does that help at all? Yeah, it, it does very much. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, it does. Yeah, so um, thank you, Peter. Um, thank you so much for all your comments. I, I think, I mean, obviously, these are 
um, ongoing discussions um, can take all sorts of dimensions, but um, your lecture does shed a lot of lights on <laughs> how to think about these things, because there, there are a lot of things that are dear to my heart <laughs> that you spoke about, and your answers as well um, would help me so she kind of um, direct my thoughts properly henceforth. Um, so thank you for a very fantastic lecture and thank you all for um, your comments and your questions. And uh, we we'll look forward to um, the February edition of um, the lecture series. Um, have um, a beautiful holiday ahead and um, do enjoy the rest and wherever you are, uh, stay safe. So I'll stop, I'll stop recording now. Let me just thank you, Elvis, though, for organizing such a fantastic series. There hasn't been a single lecture this year uh, that hasn't just been incredibly nourishing and provoking. And I think we ended on an extremely excellent note. So thank you for the care and the and the intelligence with which you've crafted this series. And I'm really excited to see what happens um, next year. But particularly, thank you, Dr. Mitova, for a really, really wonderful way to end this year. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful comments. If you, if you wanted to know those behind the scene, uh, she's the one just speaking, yeah? Sean and Andrew. I'm the one they send they send out, you know, to do to do the running around, but she's behind the scene doing all oh, the work. Oh, this is far too modest. He organized this whole